Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I have a very special announcement. Potterless is now on Instagram. What? Yes, the entire Instagram account is inspired by a tweet from dedicated listener Shiloh on Twitter, at like a nightlight. I asked the question on Twitter, I said, if I was going to make a Potterless Instagram, what would it even be pictures of? And Shiloh wrote, perfectly normal objects captioned with their new Wizarding World names, a la the put-outer. So the entire Instagram is just going to be me posting daily household objects and then giving them lame names like the put-outer. So it's at PotterlessPod on Instagram. Feel free to check it out. But I can occasionally use it for, obviously, like behind-the-scenes stuff, live streams, all kind of stuff like that. So it will be useful more than just these lame jokes. And, of course, shout-out to our newest patrons, Colleen Morrow, and two new producer-level patrons, Erica and Calvin Butler. Thank you guys so much. And thanks to all of our patrons, your support will soon be realized in two episodes when the first recording on the new fancy microphone goes live, and I am so excited about it. So thank you guys all so much. And as always, thanks to our other producer-level patrons, Leanne Davis, Andres Ozelby, and Aaron Johnson, who always manage to avoid dropping any ice cream onto the ground when eating an ice cream cone. So without further ado, let's get into this next episode of Potterless, covering chapters 20 through 22 with Rosiana Hals Roja. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Potterless, the journey of a 24-year-old man, though I'm probably 25 by the time this episode is posting, journey through the Harry Potter series. We are back with Rosiana for Yay. the final four chapters of this segment we're going to talk about, chapters 20 through 23, the big meaty chunk of the middle of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Rosiana, how are you feeling about these next few things we're about to undertake. Oh, I just can't believe how much happens in this in this in little section. You, I mean, yeah. it's great. It's great. You really feel like uh, the Triwizard Tournament has consumed the wizarding world. Yes, it really has. It's a very dense four chapters. So yeah. let's, let's get right into it. Chapter 20, the first task. Harry tells Hermione everything that happened with the serious talk and the dragon stuff and Ron and all those other things. He's stressing out about Karkarov. And she's saying, how about we just keep you alive until Tuesday evening, and then you can worry about Karkarov, which is just... She's always the pragmatist. It's so admirable. The voice (laughs) of reason forever. They're studying up in the library about how to defeat a dragon, and they're trying to think of spells to put on the dragon, but they realize that putting a spell on the dragon probably won't be any use, but instead, maybe doing something to give Harry powers would be of use. So I think that's a nice little creative solution to the problem. I just love the bit where they're going through all these books and they find this one that talks about treating scale rot and says, this is for nutters like Hagrid who want to keep them healthy. <laughs> yeah. But the dragon- like Hagrid's the only person <laughs> in the world that doesn't want to just murder dragons. Yeah, and it's from this book that's Men Who Love Dragons Too Much. <laughs> Such a great book title. Fantastic. The book titles are so good. <laughs> they are very solid. So they leave when they see Crumb walk in because Hermione's like, oh, here comes the giggle crew. So they just peace out immediately. (laughs) But on their way out, Harry sees Cedric and he realizes at this point that Cedric is the only champion who doesn't know that tomorrow is dragons because he figures that Madame Maxime is going to tell Fleur and that Kargarov is going to tell Crumb. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to tell Cedric. So he tells Hermione to walk on and he goes up to Cedric and tells him. And Cedric is really shocked. Like, why would you do this? Like, why would you help? And Harry's like, it's, it's only fair. Yeah. You're the only person who doesn't know. And Cedric thinks this is really nice of him, which it definitely is. Moody then calls Harry aside and gives him props for what he just did. He was like, hey, that was really cool. Good move, Harry. Yeah. I like Moody. I'm sad he's only going to be here for one year. Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers have either proved to be the greatest people ever or the worst people ever. Yeah. You have Turban Guy and then Lockhart. And then now you've had Lupin, who was a bro, and Moody, who's a bro. And it sucks that I know Moody's going to be gone at the end of the year. Because he's really nice. You make all these connections and they just go. Yeah. Basically, every time Harry has a teacher he likes, they go away. <laughs> Yeah. So it's horrible. But so do the ones he, do, he doesn't like. So that's That fine. is very true. So he goes into Moody's office and Moody's like, so you know about the dragons? And Harry's like, what? Uh, no. And he's like, don't worry. Cheating is a tradition in this tournament. Not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Moody tells him, he's like, you should play to your strengths. And Harry's, Harry's just not getting the hint at all. Like he's very, yeah. very obviously telling Harry to fly on a broom. And Harry's like, what? Yeah. And then he's like, play to your strengths. And Harry's like, I'm really good at Quidditch, but I don't see how that's going to help here. And he's like, holy shit. 
like fly <laughs> on your like he just wants to like beat Harry's head into a wall. He's like, maybe you could use a spell to get you what you need. And then Harry yeah. in turn is like, but what do I need? Oh and gosh. then after like a paragraph, Harry's like, oh. And then this is the quote. It's it clicked. He was best at flying. He needed to pass the dragon in the air, and he needed his firebolt. It's like, oh my gosh, like Moody's been telling you this for three pages. <laughs> <laughs> like, I get that you're dumb, but how dense are you? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hard to see what's right in front of you. <laughs> He's so dumb. So he finally gets it. He leaves, and Harry then tells Hermione... That he's like, yo, we got to get me really good at summoning charms because I'm going to need to summon <laughs> my firebolt from all the way in the castle. And that's kind of such great vindication for uh, <laughs> for them because she's like been trying to force him to yes. improve his summoning charms. Like she's been trying to this do this whole time. And he's, she's like, finally. Uh, what I don't understand, he's like, oh, it's going to be really hard to do this charm because the broom will be all the way in the castle. It's like, why doesn't Hermione, if we're already going to cheat, like if this whole tournament yeah. is based on cheating, why doesn't Hermione take the broom? wrap it in the invisibility cloak, sit in the stands with it, and then once it starts, take it out. So then Harry only has to Accio it from the stands as opposed to all the way in the castle. Probably because that implicates Hermione. Okay, yeah, that's true. Whereas this is just like, it's still kind of cheating, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it doesn't get her into trouble. That's true, yeah. I guess it just keeps her safe. But still, I feel like it's an invisibility cloak. Who's going to know? Well, I mean, so much of this tournament is like impractical. As oh, hell. God. Yes. It's, it's yeah. none of it makes any sense. It's wizard. It's very strange. But, you know, it's the Goblet of Fire. Yeah. They're practicing these charms a lot. The summoning charms. Yeah. Harry is slowly getting better. The next day goes by like a blur. Harry is called out of class by McGonagall, who seems super nervous for him, but tries to reassure him that he's like, worst case scenario, we have a bunch of wizards that can extinguish flames and put the dragon away. Like, the yeah. worst case scenario, you're not going to get hurt. You're just going to look really dumb. And Harry's like, gee, thanks. Yeah. Bagman shows up to all the champions and tells them that they draw from a bag to pick which dragon that they're going to face. And the goal of the whole challenge is to grab a golden egg. So they draw. Of course, Harry gets the hardest dragon and goes last because, you know, the book is about Harry. Yeah. And Bagman tries to offer extra help to Harry. He's like, so, Harry, do you have a plan? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, I could give you some help if you need it. And Harry's like, I, I got this, man. I don't know why you're trying to do this. Like, I've got an idea. And he's like, all right, just let me know, which is really creepy. I'm starting to suspect something is up with Bagman, too. Like, it's definitely either Crouch or Bagman who's evil in all of this. I just don't know which one. The contest then begins. The champions go out one by one while the rest of them have to stay in the waiting room. Yes. They just got to stay there. And just listen. And just listen, which is terrifying. All three are successful. So then Harry goes up. Immediately does Accio Firebolt, gets it, flies around, and he starts feeling better because now he's in his element, mm -hmm. he's acting like he's playing Quidditch, and that the dragon is just the other team. He's doing a good job of staying at bay, but then he starts to go towards the egg, and he gets hit in the shoulder with the tail of the horn tail, which I'm assuming has a horn on it, <laughs> uh, so it hurts. So then he decides just to fly super high in the air, which has served him well in the past against Malfoy, yeah. so he just flies way the hell up, to bait the dragon into going in for a big swoop on him. Once he does, he dives just super fast down his version of the Ronsky feint and goes in, snags the egg, and then he wins. So, did that. Then you learn that apparently he took the shortest amount of time to get the egg, which seems really suspect because the narrator describing it like made it seem like it was like, Crumb went out, Crumb defeated them. And then Harry's description is like five pages long. Yeah. And then it's like, oh yeah, you did it in the shortest amount of time. It's like, really? Harry flew around, made a scene, got hit, grabbed the egg. It seemed like Crumb just hit him in the face with a bullet and then grabbed the egg right away. <laughs> so. Well, he's not, he's not the most reliable narrator, <laughs> is our Harry. This is very true. Hagrid and Moody give Harry props. McGonagall sends him to the first aid tent and Madame Pomfrey has a great scene where she's just like finally upset about everything that she's had to, to deal with in the past yeah. four books, which is great. She's like, last year it was Dementors. This year it's Dragons. What is going on? Yeah, what are you doing to me? <laughs> what are you doing to these children? Yeah, what, what is this school going to do to me next? Yeah. So she helps out Harry and then goes to leave to help out Cedric. So then Hermione and Ron come in. 
Hermione's freaking out that he did so well, and Ron puts the feud at bay and says, I reckon whoever put your name in the goblet is trying to do you in. So finally, Ron has buried the hatchet. Yes. Ron begins to apologize, and then Harry says, you know what, just forget about it. But what bugged me is that Harry never apologizes. Harry never says, I'm sorry, too. He's just like, don't worry about it, Ron. Which, to me, makes it subtly seem like Harry is fully convinced that this whole thing was Ron's fault, which it wasn't. What? I don't think I don't think it was, but I understand I understand why Harry in that situation wouldn't apologize. But I agree that like he, if he was going to be a better friend, <laughs> he, he would yeah apologize. he'd be like my bad too. To I was also yeah. a terrible human being, but he doesn't. Yeah. Hermione then like cries about how stupid this whole thing was, which again proving yeah. <laughs> that she's the only person that makes sense. She hugs them, is happy, and then just runs away. It's great, but. You know, Harry was a diva last night, so I feel like he probably should have said sorry for throwing <laughs> something at your for, face. At least, yeah, at least with that At least specific. the scar comment. Yeah, at least like, yo, sorry yeah. that I said, sorry that I heavily implied that all you want to be in life is me. Sorry that I threw a badge at your forehead. Yeah, God. Ron starts describing to Harry what the other champions did. Yeah. Says that Cedric turned a rock into a dog and then tried to get the dragon to be distracted by the dog instead. <laughs> yeah. It only kind of works because halfway through the dragon sees Cedric and then burns him. Just, I love I love that idea as well. It's like, <laughs> yeah. what can I use all of my amazing magical skill to do? I'm going to turn this rock into a dog. <laughs> and, cool. and just hope that you chase the dog instead. Yeah. So then Fleur tried to put it in a trance with some sort of charm, which like made it sort of sleepy, so it kind of worked. And then Crumb, who I love his approach, just hits it in the eye with a spell and then grabs the egg. Yeah. But apparently the dragon like stumbled around and damaged some of the eggs, which caused him to be deducted some of the points from his score. Harry goes out and the judges are awarding him his scores. Madame Maxime gives Harry an 8 out of 10, which is nice. Yeah. Crouch gives him a 9. Dumbledore gives him a 9. Bagman gives him a 10, which even Harry is like, what? Like, I got hit in the shoulder. Like, there's no way I was perfect. And that's exactly my thought, too. So one of the few times Harry and I see have seen eye to eye in this series. And yeah. then Karkarov gives him a fucking 4, which... Well, it's a... He's just so corrupt. I just, like... I... How, this just begs so many questions. Like, how are the judges of this tournament the least impartial people ever? Yeah. These people clearly all have agendas. Yeah. They definitely want their own people to win. And you just expect yeah. them to be honest? Like, no way. No way at all. You also learn that Crumb received a 10 from Karkarov, even though he did something that he was supposed to lose points for. Yeah. As you've mentioned before, this tournament is very silly and impractical. Yeah. <laughs> no one's really sat down and thought it through. They're like, how can we kill fewer people? But let's not also discuss this terrible judging situation. <laughs> yeah. Which everyone's going to be biased. Uh, let's fix part of this, but not... All of it. Yeah. I just found it very silly. Like, there's a reason in the Olympics why they get people from countries that aren't competing. Like, there's a very specific yeah. reason. Well, in, in all sports, there's a reason, you know, referees in football matches. and Yeah, like, it, it's not like the ref is the coach of the other team. <laughs> He's like, oh, no, no that was a foul. <laughs> like, ah, oh, red card. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. Uh, terrible. Terrible. So Ron freaks out. Uh, and is really upset. Yes. And Harry doesn't care about getting the four. He's just really excited that Ron is pissed about Harry yeah. getting the four. Because now he knows Ron is on his side. Which I think is great. Harry's more concerned with Ron being upset at the injustice than the actual injustice. Which is just fantastic. <laughs> so Harry notices that pretty much the whole school is now cheering for him and Cedric, so people don't hate him. And he's like, well, maybe the Slytherins don't like me, but they never did anyway. Yeah. So it doesn't <laughs> really matter. Point. It's true. Yeah, super fair. But, but which I get because there are two people from Hogwarts that they don't feel obligated, like they should support Harry because he's from their school. Yeah. Like I get that they can just be like, you know what, let's only root for Cedric. That being said, I feel like there should be some Hogwarts pride. If I was even in Slytherin, I would rather Harry win than Fleur or Crumb. Just because it's like, this is Hogwarts, this is our school. Although I do think that that's a very US perspective though, because I don't think that people have the same connection to school, especially when it comes to sports and things like that, that they do in the US. Like, I feel like the U.S. is very, with, like, college leagues and college games and so on, you just, I don't know, I just don't think you have that at the same level in the U.K. Yeah. It's definitely something that I've noticed more since moving here, is just, like, 
people are so connected to their school and so connected to those achievements. Yeah. In a way that I don't necessarily know that they are so much in the UK. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely an American thing. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Some of them are cheering for <laughs> for uh, Dermstrang. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So Charlie Weasley comes up. Yeah. And he informs Harry that he and Crum are now tied for first place, and that he's supposed to go with Bagman in the champions tent because he's going to talk to the champions. Cedric in the tent gives Harry props. He's like, "Yo, super good job. That was killer." Bagman then tells the team that the next task is in mid-February and that the golden eggs that they've taken are actually clues. Yeah. There is a clue inside the egg and it tells them what the next task is, allowing them to better prepare for it. Rita Skeeter comes in <laughs> and asks Harry for a word on how he feels about the challenge and the unfair scoring system. And Harry, with the greatest line he's ever says, goes, yeah, you can have a word. Goodbye. <laughs> so Boom, like great. rap air horns ever. Like, burr, 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 burr. so great. <laughs> oh, so, so bad. bad. So bad, but so good at the same well, time. Well, so this was around the time that J.K. Rowling was starting to get a lot of attention from the UK tabloids. Um, okay. for her books and it's like all the things oh, that so, come oh, out so this is like a personal vendetta yeah it's just kind oh. of like some of the things that I think Rita says must mirror things that were said about her oh. and some of the things that Harry responds must be the lines that like when you get in a fight with someone but you come up with a really great retort like two days later yeah I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> she wrote those down and had them ready to go for Harry <laughs> that's oh so basically Rita Skeeter is a giant subtweet Yes. About the media. Yes. <laughs> that makes it so much better. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad. That's so funny. My favorite thing about it is, as the books have gone on, J.K. Rowling has done a better job of ending the chapters on, like, defining notes. Yes. Like, they'll either end on, like, a cliffhanger or something like that. And this quote from Harry is the end of the chapter, oh which I think is just so funny that it's, like, this super lame insult, and then it's, like, Bleh. Bye. Chapter 21. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun, because I've been mixing between reading the book and listening to the audiobook if I'm, like, yeah. at work or cleaning or something like that. And it's really funny when there's a pause, and I'm like, I hope that's the end of the chapter. So it's like, you can have a word, goodbye. And then it's like, one, two, yeah. three. <laughs> chapter 21. And it's like, yes, she did end the chapter on that. So like, it makes me so happy. Uh, so that's the end of chapter 20. And now yeah. we get into chapter 21. The House Elf Liberation Front, Yay. which right off the bat, I'm like, oh, good. A whole chapter about spew. I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> I'm so excited. So Ron and Harry go to write to Sirius. And Ron is shit-talking Karkarov the whole time. He is fully on Sirius's uh, bandwagon of thinking that Karkarov did it, which makes me 100% confirm that Karkarov did not do it. <laughs> because they're talking about it so much. Ron has never been correct about anything Actually, ever. Actually, there's and this big fan theory that Ron has some seer in him because there are some things that he says casually that have turned out to be true. Huh, okay. Don't spoil any future things I'm to for think of me. A non-spoiler example. But so far, Ron's been wrong about everything. It's usually when Ron's joking about something. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, definitely interesting. Once you've read them all, I'll, I'll send you some examples. Once. Well, yeah, we'll talk. We'll, we'll get you on for for an episode at the very end. <laughs> yeah. We'll be like, all right. So is Ron smart or not? Yeah. Ron update. <laughs> Just a whole episode about Ron's intelligence. So I'm personally still feeling it's Crouch with a mm -hmm. slight hint of maybe Bagman, but I think it's a stretch. <laughs> Crouch with a touch of Bagman. Exactly. <laughs> Crouch, number one, Bagman for second place. Karkarov, totally in last place. <laughs> they decide that they're going to use Pigwidgeon, who is really excited about being able to send a letter, which, again, I think Pigwidgeon is so much better than Hegwid, <laughs> like, or Hedwig. Pigwidgeon really just is, like, excited about his job and just, like, wants to fly and stuff. And I think it's great. So I'm on Team Pigwidgeon. I don't know if there's like a Team Pig versus Team Hedwig thing, but I'm totally there is, Team but Pig. I, I, I embrace like all enthusiasms for owls. <laughs> oh yeah. So the, apparently the letter that they wrote this time is bigger, longer, and heavier than usual because Harry wrote a lot of detail. This brings up a question for me: A, this letter is either multiple pages long. Yeah. B. It's either a scroll that is longer, or C, Harry's using wizard paper that gets longer depending on how much you write. Because in, if I was writing a letter, I would grab like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper yeah. and then fold it up. But apparently yeah. in this wizarding world, like how much paper you use is 100% dependent on how much you wrote. I want to know what they well, write it they on. Well, talk about rolls, they talk about rolls of parchment for homework. So they have like a roll and then he cuts it, I'm guessing, it and then rolls it up? It must be cutting it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because the essays are always like, and then Hermione submitted 
15 and a half rolls of parchment for the history of magic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so I'm guessing he just has like a big, a big yeah, old like cylinder of paper. And, and then, then okay. But poor nice. little pig widgeon. He's so tiny. Ah, oh, poor little pig widgeon. But also for everyone listening, Rosiana just did a great unscrolling oh, and yeah. cutting <laughs> hand motion on the Google chat. Yeah. <laughs> so such a great if only visual, this was a video podcast. Visual joke. <laughs> Ron tells Harry, come on, let's go to your surprise party, which makes it not a surprise party it's anymore. It's so funny, though. It's so offhand and wonderful. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and, but apparently the twins stole a bunch of food from the kitchen for it, which makes it fantastic. Yeah. So they go to the party. People at the party insist that Harry opens the egg. And yeah. Hermione's like, he's supposed to do it on his own. And then Harry's like, Hermione, you are helping me with the entire last task. <laughs> and she's like, oh, yeah, right. Okay, open it, whatever. <laughs> so, but the, also, the other thing that's interesting to me about that is that, like, in the rule, when they're reading out the rules, they say teachers can't help and you can't ask teachers for help. But it never at any point says mm-hmm. you can't ask your friends or other students for help, I don't think. Yeah, I don't, they said that they were supposed to do it on the loan, but you're, you're right that... It's kind of implied. Or they were supposed that, to do it alone. But it's implied that you aren't supposed to ask anyone for help. But I don't know if they ever explicitly said it. Yeah. I think it's mostly like, don't ask teachers. But then everyone kind mm-hmm. of assumes you're supposed to do it alone. But then no one does it alone. Yeah. So he opens the egg. Yeah. And then inside it's completely empty. But it makes like a loud screeching wailing noise. Which reminds Harry of the musical saw players in Nearly Headless Nick's band for the death day party. Yeah. Which I just want to know what the musical saw is. <laughs> And if they're, like, grinding it against something or it what, must, I'm very intrigued by Or, like, by grinding it. it against itself? Are they, like, multiple yeah, saws? Yeah, I don't know. I really want to know what the musical saw is. I'm pretty sure that this is the mermaid thing. I know that one of the tasks is mermaid mm-hmm. from the movie. So I'm assuming the mermaids, like, scream at you. I think they, like, lure you in and then scream at you and, like, knock you out or something. That's what I think I remember, but we'll okay. find out later. The kids try guessing. George says that it sounds like Percy singing in the shower. She's great. And he's like, maybe the challenge is that you have to attack him while he's in the shower. Like, <laughs> uh, the twins are the greatest they're ever. So good. They, I just, uh, I just, they're so I have to say, I just looked up the musical saw because I was curious. Oh, of, um, yeah. And it's someone using like a violin bow against a uh-huh. common like carpentry saw. That's amazing. So they, I'm going to have to watch a million YouTube videos of this. Anyways, that's like another wormhole. <laughs> but yeah, the twins are so great. The twins are so They're great. They're the greatest. So Hermione asks the twins how they got food from the kitchen. And they're like, oh, you go down, you go down the staircase. There's a painting of fruit. You tickle the pear. It giggles and then becomes a doorknob. And that's so good. Yeah. I like, if I was a wizard, I would make every single door in my house that like even if it's a closet just a bunch door of pears that you have to tickle just a bunch of different things you have to tickle like and it, it would get to the point where it's annoying like my kitchen cabinets my refrigerator everything. everything would have a tickle knob yeah but it would just be so much fun yeah it'd be great <laughs> you should you should try and find a way to do that with all this up and coming technology and stuff yeah yeah i like a touch screen and you gotta like t- act like you're tickling yeah. it oh it'd be so good so as the twins are saying this, they're like, wait a second. Are you asking this because of your stupid house elf thing? Yeah. And she's like, they deserve to be free. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great little moment. Uh, so the next day happens and they're back in magical creatures class, which means more blast ended scroots. <laughs> we've all been waiting for them. It's been two whole chapters. And that, we've been dying without they're them. They're murdering <laughs> each other. There's this bit where he's like, he's like <laughs> their desire to kill each other had not been exercised out of them. No. <laughs> yeah. Like walking them, creatures. walking them didn't help. So the scroots are now six feet long, yeah. which is as tall as I am. Yeah. This is a terrifying animal that has a big stinger or a big sucker and explodes occasionally and is the size of a full grown man. And these kids are 14 and like. Yeah. Four feet tall, five feet tall. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Horrifying. So apparently now there are, there's only 10 of them left yeah. due to all of the killings. Yeah. And I'm so intrigued of what their purpose is. <laughs> I really hope that Harry uses them as a prop to defeat one of the challenges. Like, I know I know he uses a gillyweed to defeat the mermaid. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he uses them in the maze part. And I don't know if there's more than three challenges. But I would love it if he used a blast and it's screwed to do something. He went straight to Voldemort. Yeah. He just took it to Voldemort and he's like, 
blast it. Yeah, like what if he just like Accio's a bunch of blast ended screws and then just throws them oh, at man. Voldemort and they explode him. Like yeah. they blow up Voldemort with oh, that'd be that so would good. probably be pretty effective. Yeah, it'd be way better than Expecto Patronum or whatever. So Hagrid's deciding that he wants to see if they can get them to hibernate because mm-hmm. he still knows nothing about these animals. Mm-hmm. And he wants to put them in a box that has a bunch of pillows and blankets yeah. and then nail the lid on it yeah. and then just hope that they go to bed. So they try this, but the, the screws are not having any of this. <laughs> Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle run away into Hagrid's little cabin. Yeah. Again, how does anyone support Malfoy as a bully? He's a baby. Like, he's terrified of everything. He's kind he's of He's not cowardly. good at making fun of people. And uh, I don't get how anyone agrees with any of his jesting. So the rest of the class rounds up nine of the ten, getting, like, burned and stabbed and attacked along the way. And there's one left. They're struggling with it. And this is the point where I noted in parentheses in my notes, there's no way that this is in the movie unless they become integrally important to the story. Yeah. (laughs) But I don't think that's happening. While they're rounding up the last one, Rita Skeeter comes in, uh, just making this chapter better. Like, what did we need? We needed house elves. We needed Rita. And we needed Blascended Scroots, the three greatest things that this book... All the greatest All of the... Yeah. Just bringing them all back. So she starts asking about the Scroots. And asks where they come from, and then Hagrid starts to blush. Mm-hmm. Hermione, further proving to be the greatest character in the whole book, distracts Rita by bringing Harry to light so that she'll get distracted and talk to Harry, <laughs> because clearly Hagrid got these things illegally. So Hermione is just so good at reading people. She's absolutely incredible. It's interesting to me that like that Ron's the chess player, because Hermione would be amazing <laughs> at chess. She like, yes. oh ahead. my gosh. Yeah, she really, that is so true. She should be way better. And Ron always, I don't know, I feel like Ron would just, like Ron's the kind of chess player that just like wants to kill all of the pieces right away. Because he's always jumping to conclusions right away. Whereas Hermione's like plotting things many moves ahead. Ron is just trying to take out. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, he's just like guessing. So she's like, oh, Harry, aren't these groups so interesting? And then she's like, oh, Harry's here. And then Rita starts talking to Harry. After doing this for a little bit, she goes back to talking to Hagrid and says that she wants to interview him for the zoology portion of the Daily Prophet, (laughs) which apparently is a thing. This is going to be an anti-Hogwarts piece for sure if it comes to light. So I was very, I was very worried. So was Hermione. So was Ron. So was Harry. They're all like, this is the worst thing possible. Alarm emoji flashing. (laughs) Exactly. So Hermione's biggest concern is that the, the scroots were illegally imported and that Hagrid's going to get into trouble again. So she's really hoping that doesn't happen. Yeah. Harry though is now excited that double divination is happening where he has an hour long of it because because now he can be there with Ron again and just make fun of Trelawney. Yeah. Which, uh, I can connect with so well. Like, me <laughs> and one of my best friends, Johnny, uh, we very much enjoy, like, watching a movie or a TV show or something and just kind of, like, sitting in the back and, like, whispering things to each other. And we call it Maturity Corner. Yeah. Like, we'll be like, blah, blah, blah. Like, we saw Frozen and just made fun of it the whole time. And it was the most fun thing in the world. Because I think it's a terrible film. So I can totally connect with Harry here. Just wanting to like sit in the back of the class. And when Trelawney says something, just be like, blah, 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 just, blah, blah. And like so that stupid. being <laughs> the most, one of the most like sacred moments of their friendship. Yeah. The divination and making fun of Trelawney. Yeah, it's like his least favorite class normally. But with Ron, it instantly becomes his favorite class. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so Ron and Harry then go to the library to find Hermione after class, and they don't see her there, which is a legitimate cause for concern. Like, they're actually, Mm -hmm. they're like, wait, where is Hermione? What is happening? (laughs) She's not in the library. Something is wrong. So she runs into them with exciting news and leads them through the same creepy door that Cedric went down. Yeah. And you find out that it is the kitchen. And Ron is like, oh, God, come on, Hermione. Like, not the spew stuff again. Please, no. And Hermione's like, it isn't spew. And then Ron says, quote, oh, what are we? The House Elf Liberation Front? (laughs) Which immediately makes the name of this chapter so much better. Because it's based off a joke. Like, oh, so good. Like, I went from thinking it was really annoying because it was actually going to be about them liberating the house elves. And the title of the chapter is just Ron making fun of Hermione. So good. 
Yeah. So good. It also reminded me, so I haven't seen Suicide Squad. I don't know if you have, Mm-mm. but I'm at least familiar with the meme of it where Will Smith is like, oh, what are we? Some sort of Suicide Squad? Yeah. And like people have made fun of that. So when I read this, I'm imagining like Ron turns into Will Smith. And then it's like, oh, what are we? Yeah. Yeah, like, what are we? Some sort of house self liberation front? (laughs) And I I just thought it was fantastic. This whole thing, there's such a great commentary on um, those moments when people really mean well, but they're being kind of naive. And um, a lot of the time, the word liberation, especially when it comes to like political context, the word liberation Mm -hmm. is thrown about a lot because liberation often involves making a choice for someone else that, that, that isn't coming from them themselves. So, even though he's saying it as a very like offhand joke, it's also to me like really signals some of the biggest flaws in what she's trying to do. Even though she means really well, it is a situation that needs to be improved. It's coming from her, mm-hmm. not from the house elves. So yeah. yeah, I don't know. That was like one of the big examples that for me, like a little offhand joke actually also sure. embodies something much bigger. Um, yeah, and, no, yeah, it is good. It's cool. And like J.K. Rowling used to work at Amnesty International. So it's another, oh, so you should be aware of that stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Nice. That is fun good. facts. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm loving the fun facts. These are great. Hermione says that she comes out not to talk to the elves, but she wants to show the squad like what's going on. Yeah. And maybe just like pitch the idea to some of the elves. So you go in the kitchen and it's basically the coolest kitchen in the world. And I love cooking. So when they started describing how awesome this kitchen was, I would hang out in the kitchen all the time yeah. there. Like I would try to find my way to just cook stuff there. It seems so cool. So everything is great until Dobby comes up. (laughs) You find out he's working in the kitchen, so everything is derailed. He's described as having tennis ball-shaped eyes, which I think is a very funny way to say round. Yeah. (laughs) Like, what? Just, like, protruding, big. Yeah, but I I just think it's... I I wonder whether it's more about size than about shape. Yeah, I just thought it was funny that she says tennis ball right, shaped. Right, because tennis ball like, shaped I feel is like round. she could have said tennis ball sized yeah, yeah. or like eyes that looked like tennis balls. But the fact that she said tennis ball shaped, Suspect. I thought was yeah. really funny. So apparently now he's wearing super weird clothes yeah. now that he's allowed to wear clothes. And he's wearing like a tie with no shirt and like a bunch of pins on a doily on his head and two different socks where one of the socks is the sock that Harry used to set him free via technicality, which I think is great. Yeah. So Dumbledore apparently hooked up Dobby and Winky with jobs when they were not able to find any, further proving Dumbledore is just a bro, absolute bro. All of the house elves then hook up the squad up with a bunch of food, give them a whole bunch of stuff, which is great. And then Ron makes a like a great joke where he's like, oh, great service. <laughs> and Hermione gets mad at him. Like Ron's jokes in this book have been great. I'm really excited that he's become a great like offhand yeah. comment character. Cuts attention. I'm very much connecting with Ron in that regard. I would totally be making all of these same comments that he does. <laughs> So Dobby says that he was looking for work for two years yeah, and he just couldn't find any because no one wanted to pay him. And he started describing that he would like talk to people and they would like slam doors on him once he asked for money, which for me made me a little uncomfortable because it got got, like a little too slavery-ish. Like I really wasn't liking it. It got super uncomfortable. I'm hoping that Hermione finds a way to like set them free, but I feel like it's strange. Like I get... Some of the things J.K. Rowling's writing about, like the whole mudblood thing not being cool is like her standing up to racism, which is nice. And then there's other things like trying to get rid of like gender stereotypes and things like that. But I feel like going on an anti-slavery sub-theme in the book is a little weird because it's like, I don't think anybody is pro-slavery at this point. Well, but I think... I feel like everyone's on the same page. Yeah, but I think this actually has more to do with like how the wizarding world is set up to favor wizards rather than other creatures okay. like that's that to me seems to be more the point of it not necessarily like slavery itself uh-huh. but like the i don't know kind of like the economic benefits and like the freedom of movement that that wizards like one carrying wizard wizards have versus like these other animals so you just well you kind of animals creatures who it's not a fact of like whether they have the same kind of consciousness or not because you know they do and they have like language and everything too they just uh they just work a little differently Uh so yeah I don't know I think like especially when I read it it, for the first few times I didn't I didn't think I was necessarily even thinking of it in terms of slavery I think it was more just like there's an injustice here that you assume that the wizarding world would have been smart enough to correct and they haven't and it's just kind of showing the cracks in that world Mm -hmm. 
and how I don't know, yeah, how how the how the balance is kind of tipped in favor of wizards. Yeah, no, I okay, I I I like the way that you put that makes it sounds really nice because there is like a definite inherent thing where they do put themselves on such a higher status than everyone else. Yeah, and it's right, like even even the fact that like being mudblood thing or squib thing is like such a yeah. bad thing to be. Who cares if, like, your parents were wizards or you're not as good at magic or whatever? So you're right. Like, it is a bit strange that they are a little too high status about the fact that they can do magic. And they, they almost, like, discredit muggles as, like, counting as people. The muggles are people, yeah. too. Yeah, and muggles are, like, the butt of the joke all the time. And they call them, you know, the muggles. And sure. not necessarily even maliciously, but it's just <laughs> so woven into that culture that, like being a yeah. wizard is the best thing you can possibly be which is yeah, <laughs> yeah. which is curious to me oh man okay. so that's my that's my defense of it and that's okay. what i like this what I think is really interesting about this no that's good this, uh, yeah this this storyline definitely makes me appreciate it more now that you've put a a more like a, a nicer <laughs> spin on it that makes more sense where i was just sitting over yeah. like oh this is dumb <laughs> so uh, i'm glad that you could make me feel better about this <laughs> So, uh, Winky is being strange about everything, though. She's super upset about all of the things. Dobby says that he's getting paid a galleon a week, and he gets one day off a month, which is ridiculous. And Harry's like, that's absurd. And he's like, oh, Dumbledore wanted to pay me 10 galleons a week and give me one day off a week, but I refused. I (laughs) thought that was too much. And it's like, what? What? Winky is not getting paid at all because she, quote, hasn't stooped yeah. that low yet. <laughs> like, okay, Winky, get off your high horse. And she's yeah. ashamed of being free. She still acts like she's Crouch's servant, still calls him master, and then gets into this weird thing where she kind of, like, shit talks Bagman. Yeah. Like, says Crouch doesn't like Bagman and that Bagman's a bad wizard. Yeah. Which makes me, now I'm getting closer to 50-50 on if Crouch or Bagman is the bad guy. Yeah. Especially given Bagman's weird, like, trying to help Harry thing. Super suspect. And he's so, like, overly cheerful as well. And positive. Yeah, he's too happy. <laughs> I don't know. I need more information on it. But I'm I'm less confident on knowing it's Crouch, more now thinking Bagman could be in play. Mm-hmm. But regardless, Karkarov, the farthest Definitely away possible not Kar- from Karkarov. being it. Like, <laughs> no, no way it's him at all. Zero percent chance. Winky says that she doesn't want to tell any secrets that Crouch has said about Bagman because she respects his secrecy. So yeah. doesn't say anything. She signed an NDA or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The conversation ends with Ron offering to give his Weasley Christmas sweater to Dobby this year. He's like, do you like maroon? I've got this sweater that I hate wearing every year. And uh, I want a Weasley sweater so badly. Oh, man. Like I looked online and you can like, there's some Etsy shop that'll make like a custom one, but it's like $120. It's like, uh. I have, I have like one of the official ones in the UK Whoa. that they made, uh, they made like replicas of the ones from the first films and uh okay in the like obviously in the film they have the big h on them and the big r on them Uh uh-huh and it's great Uh because they have uh all of my initials (laughs) rhr yeah oh my gosh wow you should just get lucked out both an r and an h one yeah but i do love the ones that the descriptions of like the patterns that molly you know knits onto them each time that's just Uh great yeah. I would either want to be a Weasley or best friends with the yeah. Weasleys if I was a wizard because they just have the coolest family, except for Percy. You, you definitely want to spend like family holidays with them for sure. Oh, for sure. They're yeah. the coolest. Absolutely the coolest. So the squad then leaves and they're trying to figure out the whole like Crouch versus Bagman thing yeah. and, and what to think of uh, Winky's comments. And that is the end of chapter 21. So we get into chapter 22, which is the unexpected task. To which I'm thinking, oh, it's not unexpected. It's totally mermaids. But then the (laughs) chapter opens with McGonagall announcing the Yule Ball. And I was like, oh, the unexpected task is getting a date for the Yule Ball. (laughs) (laughs) So I was quickly, quickly put in my place. The title sounds so (laughs) foreboding. Which is great. It's it's just getting a date. Yeah. Yeah. The back to back, like really great titles of chapters Uh. throwing me for loops. Really solid about it. So the ball is on Christmas Day, Mm -hmm. which I think is a little weird because now everybody's got to stay at school for break, which (laughs) is okay because Christmas at Hogwarts is awesome from all the descriptions. I would do it, no question. Yeah. Not even think twice about it. But you can't see your family on Christmas if you want to go to the ball. Seems slightly problematic for scheduling purposes. McGonagall says that the champions and the partners open the ball. 
and Harry's flustered because he's like, first off, now I got to find a date. Second, I have to dance. And he's being like, huh, I don't want to dance because he's a loser. He's never danced in his life. Fully yeah. on board with the Potter Stinks movement because he's <laughs> trash. So <laughs> I just love dancing. So he decides that finding a partner will be harder than tackling a dragon. Yeah. Which I think is a bit of a hyperbole, Harry, because girls can't kill you. Yeah. I think he's catastrophizing a little bit. And the thing is, he's got like such an easy course of action. Yeah. If he wants to ask the person that he actually likes, he can just go to Cho Chang. Yeah. If he wants to just go with a friend, he can ask Hermione. And if he wants a guaranteed yes, he can just ask Ginny. Yeah. Like, he's got a perfect trifecta of options, yeah. but instead, he just doesn't do anything for, like, a week. He just and panics. then has to, yeah, and then has to ask a random person. He's like Hamlet over here. So, <laughs> so Ron asks Harry who he's going to ask, and Harry goes into this, like, daydream about how beautiful and great Cho Chang is. Yeah. <laughs> Just, like, heart eye emoji for Cho. But he's too much of a wuss to ask her. But you And you learn that part of the reason he's scared is because she's a year older than him, and she's very popular, which I don't know if they've clarified before. But he's Harry freaking Potter. Yeah, but Come I guess goes to show he doesn't see himself as that. Yeah, so I guess it's good that he doesn't... He doesn't have any sort of arrogance to him which is nice yeah. but you should have like a little bit it's good but in this instance you've got to like dig deep yeah in this instance you gotta be like yo i'm harry yeah. potter if i ask anyone they get to be in the premiere dance like they get to open the ball like if anyone said no to me they're dumb <laughs> i don't know he should just shoot for the moon ron tells him he's like you shouldn't have any problem finding a date you're harry potter and it turns out to be true because these random girls that you've never heard of yeah. just start asking <laughs> harry to ask him to the dance and harry like very awkwardly just like tells them all no immediately which is fantastic harry does note that people seem to have been nicer to him at school yeah. and he suspects that this is because cedric probably told the hufflepuffs to ease up on him since harry tipped him off about the dragon what a so, good, nice good move by robert pattinson yeah. what a yeah what a guy what a hero <laughs> <laughs> Haggard's interview finished and Haggard just has this adorable moment where he's like, it's really weird. She didn't want to talk about blast ended scroots or magical creatures. She, it seemed like she just wanted me to shit talk Harry. Yeah. And the squad's like, yes, of course. She's only said nice things about Harry. She was trying to get another angle about it. Like he's so astonished that people don't want to talk about the blast ended scroots. Yeah. He's first astonished that they don't want to talk about that. And then he's second surprised that anyone would think ill of Harry. And because of that, they're like, oh, well, you know, she could have just interviewed Snape. And he would have said, like, some awful stuff. Yeah. And Hagrid goes into this whole thing where he doesn't know that they're talking about a hypothetical situation. And he starts, like, actively defending Harry. And he's like, whoa, well, maybe maybe Harry's, like, broken some of the rules, but I think he's always had good reason. And he just, like, <laughs> goes into this whole big thing. He's like, no, one. it's so, oh, uh, it was the cutest moment so in the great. whole book where Hagrid is just like, no, That's Harry's right. a great guy. I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> uh, apparently, Dumbledore has booked the Weird Sisters for the ball. Yeah. Which... Sounds familiar, and I feel like people have made references to it, but I don't know what. But they're a, a world-famous band, yeah. apparently. Yeah, that it's been, like, a few times mentioned in the general, like, pop culture fabric of, like, the Weasleys uh -huh. and so on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hermione's a little upset that Harry hasn't figured out the egg clue yet, yeah. and... She's taking it very personally. Yeah, she's like, you should probably try to figure this out. Uh, Ron is making a house of cards with a deck of cards that are more exciting than muggle cards because they can blow up at any yep. second, which doesn't sound exciting at all. The house of cards explodes and singes Ron's eyebrows. <laughs> I don't like. I don't understand why he did this or why he thought it was a good idea. I, I, he's probably not just used to normal packs of cards. <laughs> he's like, what, your cards don't explode? Yeah. Yeah. So, man. So the twins come up and they ask Ron and Harry like who they're taking to the dance. And they basically say that they're too chicken shit to ask anyone. Yeah. And Harry's like, well, who are you going to ask? Ask Fred, and he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna ask Angelina, but I haven't asked her yet." <laughs> so he stands up in the cafeteria and then just screams like, "Hey, Angelina!" And she's like, "What? <laughs> you want to go to the dance with me?" And she's like, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> and that's the the interaction. And oh, I thought it was the funniest thing ever. Like they are clearly the greatest couple. Yeah. In the whole series, the fact that they would have that dynamic. I it's really so love good. Angelina. She's someone who I, I wish had had more of a role in the film. Yeah, I would have loved for her to get chosen as the champion. Yeah. Yeah, and she just adds that little bit of like, she's a good person, she's cool, but she's also like fun and lighthearted. And I think sometimes the films she's, get a yeah. little bit more of that, like show that they're actually just kids. Uh -huh. Yeah, she's yeah. also black and it would be nice if there was yeah. a non-white person that was important for once. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Like and, everyone and is Dean. white except for Cho Chang. Like, <laughs> There's no important people of color. Dean Thomas. Oh, uh, 
Love him. Right, Dean Thomas. Okay, good. I was really sad because I remember in the movie with the asking this scene, yeah. rather than yelling it across the cafeteria, it's like he throws a note at her and then like whispers and then, like, it to he her or something. The dancing. It's yeah, he minds. It's like so much worse. Yeah. It's n- like this was so much better. I don't know who the screenwriter for the fourth movie is, but he fucked up because this is like <laughs> the funniest thing in the book. And he's like, you know what we should do? Let's change this so it's yeah. not funny anymore. It's like, ugh. They kind of make it a little bit of like a montage bit after that as well. And it's like, no, it doesn't work. Need to, yeah, yeah, it's dumb. And and he and in the book, after after she says all right, he sits down and then he's like, Whoop, well, there you yeah. have it. Like, uh, so uh, just so good. It's absolutely beautiful. It's and I was so so disappointed. So Ron tells Harry that he's like, Yo, we gotta get a move on, or we're gonna get stuck with trolls, which is <laughs> yeah, a like, Ron, painfully misogynistic on. thing to say. And Hermione immediately is like, What? Yeah. Like, did you really just say that? And then she's like, Oh, why don't you ask that girl who apparently had really bad acne, but it's gotten better? And Ron's like, oh, she still has acne, which I can connect with. I've had terrible acne my whole life, and I've done medications and proactive and all this other stuff, and it's, like, still there. So the fact that Ron's just like, no, she has acne, it's like, fuck you, Ron. Like, come on, man. She can't control it. But then he's also like, her nose is off-center. Yeah, the like, worst. What does that uh, even mean, Ron? Uh. It's, oh, man, so terrible. And Hermione's like, she's really nice and is, like, a really good person. And then he says, yeah, her nose is off-center. Uh. So she then, Hermione then replies, are you just going to take the most attractive girl who will say yes? And then Ron says, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Which, like, I appreciate his honesty. Such a misogynist. But it's like, come on. Uh, So terrible. Harry still hasn't asked Cho because he wants to, like, find a situation where she's alone. But she's one of the most popular girls in school. So she's always surrounded by people. Yeah. So he finally just decides, he's like, you know what? I can just ask her. Can I have a minute? Like, can I can I talk to you alone for a second? Which you should have done in the beginning. That's how normally asking people to dance is works. He doesn't know, uh, man. He finally does this. And then Cho is like, yeah, what's up? And he takes like an awkwardly long time to ask her. But then he finally is like, do you want to go to the dance with me? And then she like looks really sad. And the narrator makes a point to say, to like note that she looks genuinely disappointed, yeah. but says, oh, like, I've already been asked by someone. I was like, this has to be Cedric. Because I wasn't sure from the movie if they did, but I was like, it's got to be Cedric. Yeah. And then Harry asks, who is it? And she's like, oh, it's Cedric. And Harry, the best is that that has, like, a narrator note. Harry thought Cedric was cool, but now he fucking hates him. Yeah, like, like he's, he's suddenly, he thought, like, angry. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, Cedric's a good dude. And he's like, no, he's not. He's, he's pretty and annoying, and I hate him. So... Quick does a 180 on his opinion of him. Yeah. Harry then goes back to the dorm, sees Ron and Ginny, and Ron's got this, like, dazzled look on his face. And he's like, what's wrong? And he's like, I don't know why I did it, but I just asked Fleur to the dance. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you idiot. You're so dumb. <laughs> but then when Ron describes the situation, it's like they were in a group, and he was talking to Fleur and Cedric Diggory, and Harry's like, oh, she was probably just using her, like, Vila spell thing to, like, try to talk up Cedric, and you just got swept up in it. No big deal. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, well, that was silly because... Cedric's already going with Cho. And Harry's like, yeah, I know. I asked her. And then Ginny gets sad, which is like, ugh. <laughs> so depressing. She's got, she's burning that flame. <laughs> just, so now, yeah, so now Ginny hates Cho Chang. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Neville, uh, you learn, asked Hermione, but Hermione said no, that she's going with someone else. And Ron immediately thinks that this is a cover. He's like, oh, there's no way Hermione's actually going with someone at the dance. She was probably just being nice. Hermione is then there, and he's like, you know what, Hermione? Neville is onto something. You are a girl. Do you oh, want to go to the dance with one of us? Just and then the Her- Hermione, yeah, Hermione's like, are you kidding me? Like, you're yeah. just noticing now? And he's like, what do you mean? And he's like, I've been a girl for three and a half years. Like, what are you talking about? And she continues to tell Ron that she's going with someone else, and he, like, won't believe her until Ginny's like, Ron, Ugh. Ron, she's actually going with someone else. Like, I saw it happen. <laughs> like, it's happening. He's so bad in this scene. He's like... He's really bad. He loses a lot of my favorability points. It, yeah, it's kind of like how... It's a mix of, like, how could she get a date? And then also, like, I'm entitled to ask her out on a date. She's she's our friend. She's our Hermione. It's weird. Yeah. I don't like it. No, I don't like it at all. Not a fan. <laughs> Ginny's cool in this, though. Definitely just, like, taking Hermione's friendship for granted. Yeah. He's been cool the rest of the book, but this was just, like, less than ideal. Yeah. Ron then says to Ginny, like, hey, you should go with Harry. And Ginny's like, oh, Neville asked me, and I figured since I'm a second year, no one else was going to ask me. So I said yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which, you know, makes sense. So Harry then goes up to Parvathy and then is like, hey, do do you want to go to the dance with me? 
And she's like, yeah. And then Lavender Brown is with her. And he's like, hey, Lavender, do you want to go with Ron? And she's like, oh, I'm going with Shanice. Yeah. So then Parvathy's like, oh, my sister could go with Ron. Padma, she's in Ravenclaw. And then Ron's like, okay. And that's the end of chapter 22. <laughs> <laughs> they just arranged. Yeah, so that's just pretty much it. This weird, like, best friends going on a date with twins situation, uh, which yeah. I did once, which you was did? weird. I had a friend who, uh, he was, like, setting me up with a blind date sort of situation, yeah. and I was all on board. And then it was, like, a couple hours before the date, and he's like, oh, by the way, your date is my girlfriend's twin sister. And I was like, this is the weirdest. Were they identical? They were identical twins, but very different people. Okay. Um, in the fact that my friend's girlfriend, the twin I was not on the date with, was very nice, and the girl oh, that no. I went on the date with was very mean. <laughs> oh, so, no. <laughs> yeah. It was like, they were identical in all the ways that didn't matter. <laughs> like, I right, was like, because uh, right. my thought was like, oh, maybe she's, maybe she's like her sister and is like cool and fun and nice. Like, oh, no, she just looks the same and is oh, bad. Oh, no. What so disaster. It was, it was it was a rough situation. Uh, she, I, I, I'm assuming she's not listening to this podcast. Hi, but if you are. If she is, hello. <laughs> so good to see you. Ah, uh, high school. Good times, am I right? No, I'm not. <laughs> high school is terrible. Hey, everyone. It's me, your old pal, Editing Mike. I'm here because despite having two more chapters worth of discussion recorded with Rosiana, this episode already got pretty long, and if I added those two in, it would have been way too long. So we'll pick it up next time for chapters 23 and 24 with Rosiana. But anyway, thank you guys so much for listening. As always, you can subscribe to us on any of your preferred podcasting apps. You can find us on Twitter at PotterlessPod, at Facebook.com slash Potterless, and if you want to pledge money to the podcast in exchange for some bonus content, you can head on over to patreon.com slash potterless, get some behind the scenes stuff, director's commentary, bonus episodes, stuff like that. If you want to see more of Rosiana, you can go to her YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Rosiana with two N's, and she's at Twitter at Paper Time Lady. But until next time, as the official motto of Hogwarts states, wizard on! <laughs> Potterless was created by Mike Schubert, it is hosted by Mike Schubert, it is edited by Mike Schubert, it is produced by Mike Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Andreas Ozelby, Aaron Johnson, and Erica and Calvin Butler, and the music is by Bettina Campamanes. I've covered everything I need to in the intro except one thing. If you guys could head on over to iTunes and give us a rating, that actually does help a ton. It helps more people find the podcast, and then we can get more friends, so that would be great. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening, and until next time, wizard on! Wizard on!